make this happen. So this month's um, theme, let me get this out of the way for you, is free, which I, I mentioned. Um, and I have a few words for you on, on, on what free might mean. Um, what is free comes in many flavors. Free to come, free to go, free to love, free to deliciously inhabit our own skin, free to try on all the possible versions of ourself. Free, as in not charging a single cent. Free to speak truth to power. Free to say no to what's on offer. However, to be free to dream, to create, to imagine requires freedom from. Freedom from. To be free from want and fear, to be free from censoring forces, to be free from oppression. To strive for true freedom is to honor our obligations to each other, to fight for our mutual liberation. When someone is free to achieve their fullest creative expression, they become a beacon for us all. How will you make space for your own flourishing and that of others so that the world around you might also bend towards freedom? Our Charlotte chapter chose this month's exploration of free and uh, Livonia Parks illustrated this theme and we're very grateful for both. Okay, let's do this. So we have a speaker here today uh, Sarah, who, whom I know, and I will, uh, I will tell you how I know her. I, th I think the first time I met her was when I attended a Nexium um, um, introductory get to know you event. And I did subsequently take Nexium training. So I have some insight into what that story was like for her, but not nearly the experience, of course, that she had, some of which she'll tell you today. Um, but you all have heard her bio. She's an extraordinary uh, actress and writer and podcaster and advocate and activist and mom and oh my gosh, on and on. But here are a few things I asked her last night uh, to share with me. She had her own business cards and business by the time she was 10 years old. Her business cards were pink. She made hair wraps and jewelry on the beach on Hornby Island. During her acting career, she has helped William Shatner memorize lines and babysat David Hasselhoff's children. <laughs> I don't think she got a credit for that one. And finally, her brothers-in-law, and now this is true, her brothers-in-law are named Huey, Dewey, and Louie, and sister-in-law is named Daisy. So basically, she married into a family of ducks. So ladies and gentlemen, I, with that, give you the one and the only Sarah Edmondson. Uh, <laughs> I forgot about that. Those little nuggets that I gave you, Mark, made myself laugh. Thank you so much for having me and for inviting me here today. Um, I really wish that this could have been in person before I get started, everything sounds good? Yes. Amazing. So yeah, when Mark asked me to come, it was around the time when we thought it could be in person. And then I got the call saying, we're back to Zoom. And I was like, damn it, Omicron, Omicron. Doesn't that feel a little bit like a transformer? Does anyone else hear that? Or maybe it's just my voiceover career kicking in. Omicron, virus in disguise. No, anybody? Okay, I can't like interact with you. So I don't know if that's... <laughs> That's resonating. Jordan says yes. Okay, amazing. Anyway, not here to uh, show off my voiceover skills today. I'm here and Mark, if you would please show that first slide. Ta -da. Okay, October 17th, 2017. There I am on the cover of the New York Times. That was just the beginning. After that came the CBC podcast, Escaping Nexium, with 25 million downloads. The Vow, a docu-series uh, on HBO. Um, somewhere around 200 interviews I've lost track and a memoir. But that's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. I'm here to, to tell you about how I healed from this shit show. And yes, I just found out that I can swear, which is true freedom for me. Thank you, Mark. Um, how I healed from that and how I reclaimed my voice. But uh, 
you know, every healing story, every healing journey does have a backstory. And since you can, you can Google most of it, I'll just, I'll kind of give you the cliff notes just to summarize how I got into Nexium, how I got out and how I use my creativity to, to find my voice and to heal again. Thank you, Mark. We could get rid of that image and I'll talk more about it later. <clears throat> so my story, I grew up here in Vancouver. I know not everyone's in Vancouver, but we are in Vancouver here, Creative Mornings Vancouver. And in the seventies, my parents were therapists and or still are actually, but they were in the, in the seventies and eighties, they were social activists. We marched across the, the bridge, the broad bridge for peace. And I was always instilled with this message of leave the world a better place and make a difference. And that was something that I was always strove, uh, strove, I strived to do. And my mom, I consulted with her about this speech. I said, mom, what was I like as a creative person? And she was like, oh, you were so creative from the moment you were born. You were this creative spirit. And apparently when I was around three and, and people started asking me, you know, what do you wanna be when you grow up as adults do? It was four things. One is I wanted to be an artist. Two, I wanted to be a mummy. Three, I wanted to be a princess. <laughs> and contradicting, contradicting to the princess, I also wanted to be a French maid because I really like the little aprons and the little black and white outfits. I uh, managed to, I think, hit all of those career goals, I think. And I also was a kind of girl or a young you know, child who would gather the kids together at a dinner party and, and put, a, put a performance on at the end of the night. And I was always um, into various classes. I was an arts umbrella, which is the local children's art program here. I, was, I did all the classes there, pottery and dance and ballet and jazz and photography and acting. I was very, very artistic, but I chose a path as an actor when I graduated um, high school and went to University of Concordia and got my BFA, my Bachelor of Fine Arts, also known as a Bachelor of Fuck All in theater performance. But I was very excited about becoming an actor and using my voice as a platform for change. That's what I thought I was going to do. And I moved back to Vancouver in the early 2000s and was auditioning and was very much the stereotypical actress slash waitress living in the basement suite. And I found that even though I was technically a working actor, doing beer commercials and vampire TV shows and all of these, um, you know, things, there's nothing wrong with those things. And they certainly paid the bills, but it wasn't filling my creative cup and it wasn't meaningful to me. And I felt like there was more. I always felt like there was more. And around this time, I started the Artist's Way group. I'm sure many people have this book. This would be like 2003 or so. Da -da -da. put that away and I gathered up a group let's see gathering again <laughs> gathering up a group of my um, girlfriends mostly actresses and we got together every Tuesday morning and we talked about our goals and we did the morning pages and we gave each other feedback and we ate muffins and it was very productive but not productive enough for me and I always felt like even though my parents were therapists I love to help people and gather and build community I wasn't really able to help people through their issues because guess what? I wasn't a therapist. And around this time, I met um, a man named Mark Vicente. He was the director of a film called What the Bleep Do We Know? And at that time in the early 2000s, this film blew my mind and it was kind of catapulted me on my more spiritual journey. And I was really into setting intentions and I wanted to figure out my purpose. And I had the opportunity to meet him at a film festival because my boyfriend at the time was a, still is a director. And we got to go and Mark Vicente was the guest speaker, the guest of honor. And we met him there and we became fast friends. I really, though truly, I really admired him. I put him on a pedestal and I thought, that's what I want to do. Like with the bleep, I want to make conscious shifting media. I don't want to do beer commercials and vampire TV shows. I want to make films and media that shift people's consciousness and help people have a different understanding of, hum of humanity. So when he said to me, well, if you like my film, you may like this workshop that I just took. I 
jumped at the opportunity to work with him and to figure out who this team of humanitarians were that were changing the world. Like it was the most exciting thing to me. And the other thing I wanted to add when I met him before I went to that film festival, I had set the intention of finding my true purpose. So I felt here it was, the universe provided. Leap and the net will appear. And there it was. So I felt like everything was very serendipitous. And I jumped in, I signed the contract. And I, something I remembered recently is that I actually backed out a couple of weeks before the training, which happened to be in Vancouver a few weeks after I'd met Mark. And I called the headquarters, I called the mothership and I was like, and I put a deposit down for $500, by the way, for a $2,000 program. So for the actress living in the basement suite, this was a big, a big ask. And I said, you know, I'm an actor and I, I don't think I can take five days away. And I spoke to a woman who I'd never met before who would later become a mentor. And she said, do you always want to be waiting for your agent to call or do you want to be the captain of your own ship? And she got me there because I didn't want to be the captain of my own ship. I didn't want to be waiting for my agent to call. So I jumped in. I jumped in. I took the five-day training and I was a mixture between you know, the keener, the front row taking notes. And I found out that Americans don't say keener. So I'll say the keen person, the goody two shoes, who was like trying to get it all in. And also being like, my parents are therapists. What are you going to teach me? So I was skeptical, but also open. And that first five day training, that first day was a really a bizarre mix, mixture of really helpful life hacks and really bizarre uh, rituals. And I had so many red flags, so many uncomfortable things. And this is something people always ask me, like, when were the red flags? And what did you see? All of it, all of the weirdness came after a very brilliant preempt by the facilitators, which was that you're going to feel uncomfortable. We're here to work on your shit. We're here to work on your issues. So if you're feeling uncomfortable or have the urge to leave, that means you're doing it right because you're hitting up against stuff. And the fact of the matter is, is there some truth in that? If anyone's ever been to counseling or therapy or even an acting class, it's uncomfortable to be vulnerable and to expose yourself. But it also, and I didn't really understand this till about 15 years later, I was right from day one, overriding my gut instinct to get the fuck out. Also because I trusted Mark. On that first day, I call, I went home and I Googled the company for the first time. And there was some shit online, not like there is online about Nexium now, but there was enough stuff to be like, what the fuck did you get me into, Mark? And Mark said, as someone had done for him, no, nothing against Mark. He didn't know what was going on either. And he said to me, well, um, do you believe everything that you read online? There, there's lots of things that people can write about anyone anytime. Does it mean it's true? And I thought, well, no, of course not. I don't believe everything that's written online. I'm not that naive. And he said, why don't you trust your own experience? I know it's weird. Wait till day three and just see how it goes. And why would you trust someone's experience who's never even taken our curriculum and you're there? Get your money's worth. And I did. I trusted him. And that's something that's important to know is that all the red flags from that point on were always outweighed by the goodness and the trust that I had in the people around me and especially the people above me that I respected. That authority ranking system played a huge part in why I stayed. Anyway, I stayed till day three and I didn't know this at the time, but you can actually indoctrinate someone into a new way of thinking in three days if they're focused and if they're open and there's enough repetition and emphasis on certain concepts. And I was that person. And on day three, I did have a huge shift. I had a huge shift because I went to next and trying to figure out why I was so stifled as an actress and what would it take to get me to the next level. That was one of my goals. I had some relationship goals as well. But in terms of that shift, I had huge core awarenesses, which are difficult to explain in this type of context, but understanding that I got in touch with what was holding me back in terms of my own relationship with myself, my self-worth, my confidence, and how that expressed as an actor. And let's just say by the end of that five days, I was totally bought in. I felt like this veil had been lifted. I had total clarity on my whole life and uh, understood why I wasn't able to communicate with certain people, why I wasn't able to, to ask for what I wanted. 
I was able to see the world so clearly in such a way that I felt like I'd been given the secret handbook for living. And I wanted everybody to have it because I felt so good. Didn't understand that I was literally having this massive dopamine hit for all the awarenesses. If you think about uh, what it's like to have an awareness in therapy, and I was there for five, uh, five days for 12 hours a day, having probably three to five awarenesses an hour, I was just pff, mind blown. So let's just say um, by those end of the five days, I you know, found my tribe, I found my way of life. And I felt like you know, if everyone in the world had these tools, that they'd have more honor and more integrity and they'd be able to achieve their, their goals in life. And I really also felt like if the leaders, all the world leaders had this curriculum, there truly would be war no more back to the meaning of marching across the bridge for peace in the 80s. <laughs> so it all came together for me. And if I could summarize the next 12 years, it would be something like this. I took more classes. I went to Albany. That's where the mothership was, Albany, New York. Yes, the armpit of America. No offense to anyone who lives there. And I used the tools, the tech, as they called it, to break into the voiceover community here in Vancouver. That was a much coveted, very cliquey, cliquey spot to, to find my way into finally. And I used the emotional tools to deepen my um, experience and my work as an actor. And I played a role in a film that got in Toronto Film Festival, which was like, I just felt like I was really hitting all the markers of the reason I joined Nexium in the first place. And it was exciting. It was glamorous. I rode on the Bronfman private jet to go teach a training in Alaska. I was traveling to Mexico and to the US. I felt like, wow, how lucky am I to be in my late 20s and, and working with all these incredible people who are actually changing the world, or so I thought. But all of us were following the company's ranking system, this ladder, which if you've seen the value, you've seen the sashes, and it was called the Stripe Path. And one of the things I really liked about that as an actor was that, um, and most of you know this as artists, is that like you can do all the things, but if you're not producing your own content, you may not get the job. So I was, you know, I was in acting class and I was in shape and I could, you know, I was off book. I had my lines memorized for auditions, but I wasn't always booking. Whereas the Stripe Path was, or so we thought, was boom, boom, boom. If you do this, then you can get promoted and you can go up the, the ranking system. It was very similar to a martial arts system like karate. That's how it was explained. And I really liked that. It felt like it was good for my self-esteem because I was in control of my path of growth. And that's what it offered, measurable growth and guaranteed, if you got to the end, enlightenment, which now I know is impossible. But all of us were going for, we want to be more joyful, more successful, more purposeful. I proudly opened the first center in Canada here in Vancouver, kept going traveling on missions to help other people have the same transformational experiences. And I felt like I had this new worldview. I had, I had all the answers to life questions, but also more importantly for me, I had a community, a community of like-minded artists and entrepreneurs and all these young people who were really striving to be the best versions of themselves. And in addition for me to help, she start achieving my own goals, I was learning to coach and helping other people achieve their goals. And I thought this was amazing. I thought it was just like, I was the luckiest girl in the world. <clears throat> but as you know, because you know the story, it wasn't all peaches and cream. There was so many things, like I said, from day one that were problematic, but I didn't understand what I was seeing. And some of the inconsistencies right from the beginning. So as I mentioned, I started to achieve these goals. And then I was tacitly punished for being attached to my career. And I couldn't wrap my head around that because I thought this is a success program. Most people know it as Nexium, but here in Vancouver, we, we taught just the personal development part of it, which was called executive success programs. And I thought I'm using the tools to become more successful, but now I'm too attached. They always wanted me to move to Albany and they would say, well, I guess you're more attached to your materialism in your career. Somebody actually said to me once when I was deciding whether to do a film or to go to Albany for another training. And they said, well, what's more important, Hallmark 
or saving humanity. And that's how it was presented. It was never, no one ever told me what to do, but it was a tacit enforcement of making sure that personal development was your highest value. For me, when I joined, there was an exercise, and I actually recommend this to people still, but for different reasons. I couldn't make decisions to save my life. That's one of the reasons I joined Nexium is to like get more clear on who I was and my values so I could decide. And I always felt like I was choosing between things. Um, and I couldn't, didn't have a tool set to make those decisions. So they had us write down uh, your values, prior, your, the pr write down your values in priority order. So at the time it was acting and creative expression was number one. And the rest were things like um, humanity and joy and family and financial security, personal development. And slowly over time in Nexium, personal development started moving up I realized that you couldn't really go up the stripe path or get promoted or do anything unless personal development was number one. So my creative goals and my expression started to take a back seat. And I didn't realize that was happening. It was, a, it was a slow burn, but that was one of the inconsistencies I saw in the company is that people were putting aside their own goals for the mission of the company. Um, the other thing was, is that we were supposed to be building humanity, building community, but we were also very righteous towards anyone who was not willing to jump in. And I am sure there's people on this who I know from Vancouver who were invited by somebody and maybe they took a training like Mark did, or maybe they didn't, but they probably got a sense of that. There was this like, and people did say to me later, I was interested, but there was something weird about it. Like you guys were just so happy. <laughs> So I feel like the combination of the righteousness and the happiness, also known as toxic positivity, which is a, a real buzzword that's going around right now, a term that I, I'm now talking about when I, when I speak, because I didn't know that's what was going on for me. I was supposed to be engaging in critical thinking, but we weren't allowed to look at anything negative that was ever said about us. In fact, we weren't allowed to express anything negative at all because that would mean that the tools don't work. So if you'd met me during this time and said, hey, Sarah, you know, how are you? It would have been like, I'm so good. I am amazing. My life is so incredible. And I truly did feel that, but I also had this thing in the back of my mind. I couldn't share like, but I'm also struggling with this or, oh, I'm a little worried about money or whatever. You could never say anything like that. So the inconsistency of like portraying somebody that wasn't actually authentic started to wear at me. And all of these things, like look, understanding um, that I was learning a, a new doctrine, I didn't understand that it was actually an, an indoctrination. And all of these things were, were things that I was witnessing in moments and experiences that like didn't always feel right, but I couldn't wrap my head around it. And there's a metaphor that we use in, in cult recovery that many times there's an experience or a moment that you have, and then you like put it on Oh, there's a shelf behind me. You put it on the shelf, right? And it's the same thing in an abusive relationship. The first time the partner is, you know, violent verbally or says something that doesn't align with the previous personality, you go, whoa, did that just happen? And you put it on the shelf. And all of my things that I shelved over and over again, the toxic positivity and like how the company was operating and the fact that we weren't getting paid for certain things. And um, the righteousness, that, which later became a very much an us versus them, um, an us versus them feeling that I had in the community. All of these things were just shelved, shelved, shelved. But the thing that was the most uncomfortable that I didn't understand at the time, and what I'm very passionate about now when I speak, is that anytime that I had a concern or anytime I had a fear come, come up. And anytime that I wanted to express something to anybody, I couldn't go to my downline, like anyone who is below me in the ranking system, because that would mean I'm not a solid leader or that I don't have my shit together. So I would go to my upline, to Mark or somebody else above me, my coach or my sponsor or Nancy, the, the, um, the head of the school. And someone's phone just came on or someone's, someone just unmuted and I'm hearing something. I don't know if, where that's coming from. I hear like papers rustling. Hello. Okay, it's gone. We're good. We're good. Just a heads up on time, Sarah. We're at 9.25, yeah. so another 10, 10 minutes or so would be great. Okay, great. I'll try to speed it up. 
<laughs> so what was I just talking about? Oh yeah. So if I brought something like that to a facilitator, it was always met with um, what I now know is gaslighting. So if I brought something up, they would say, well, what are you making that mean? Or you seem really reactive about that. You may want to journal on it or sit with it. Or why don't you go work, get an EM and which is like a process to unpack the whole other, that's a whole other talk, but basically work with a facilitator to figure out why I was triggered versus maybe there's a reason I'm triggered because I'm seeing something that's not right. And all of those things made the shell so heavy. And I think one of the things that made it the heaviest is that I had really developed the recognition that my self-worth was attached to my acting and I pulled that apart so that I didn't feel so dependent, but now I was dependent on this other thing. And dependency was taught to be bad, but all of us were just worshiping the leadership and we were fully dependent. We couldn't, we couldn't do anything without running it by the, by the leadership. And that was something that really started to wear on me. And just before I woke up, I, my husband and I had a, our first child, Troy, in 2014, and I started to reprioritize my values. And I think the company shift, uh, sensed that shift because they offered me an opportunity to level up and join a secret sisterhood. If you've seen the vow, you know the details of this. I'm not gonna go too much into it because it's very complicated, but I was joined, asked to join the sisterhood um, badass boot camp for women, essentially. And I was supposed to have a secret ceremony where I get a tattoo. This is a very trigger warning, um, very disgusting, violent part of my story. But long and short of it is on that night, I was not given a tattoo. I was branded like what farmers do to cattle. And crazily enough, that in and of itself didn't wake me up. It was finding out weeks later that the symbol on my body was not the four elements as I'd been told, but it was, it was the leader's initials in a cryptic monogram seared into my flesh right here on my pelvis, Keith Ranieri, KR. That's what woke me up. And finally, Mark and I start to speak freely and share what he knew. And I shared with him what I knew for the first time after I signed an NDA because we were both so afraid of being sued. And we figured out what was going on and that the, the branding was a disgusting, deceptive attempt to lock down loyalty. Keith realized that people were leaving and he wanted, he wanted people to stick around and he was basically set up a blackmail MLM structure for him to essentially have the women in his organization. And that was ultimately woke me up realizing that everything was built on lies, the whole foundation. I'd never researched who Keith was. I didn't know that he was a complete con man. He wasn't a celibate monk. He was had a harem of women, anywhere from 12 to 20 women available to him at any given time to meet his needs. And ultimately, this, this is what woke me up and, this, and triggered it was the catalyst for me to decide to expose the company, become a whistleblower and go to the New York Times. So all of that to say is I woke up pretty quickly. I realized this was not a healthy community, um, but it was a self-sealing system with zero accountability and no room for personal opinion, no autonomy, thus no creativity. Because creativity at this point, I realized, and I've, you know, in, prepar in preparing for this talk, if you cannot be creative if you're not, if you cannot, can't connect with your true self. And my true self had been overridden a long time ago with what they call the cult identity. Also, you can't create anything new, any divergent ideas, unless the ideas is in line with the, the leader's mission and any, anything creative had to be to like support him and to get his, his message out there. So my, my creativity was, was long, long gone. Needless to say, I figured out it's true. I was in a cult. And this is something that if you heard of Nexium or ESP over the years, some people would say, yeah, it's, it's a bit weird or it's culty, but like nobody really knew what we were doing that was that made it an actual cult. And I would even joke with my agent about it when I went to Albany. He's like, oh, here she goes again. I'm like, yeah, Murray, shaving my head. I'm drinking goat's blood because that's what I thought a cult was. Robes and flavor aid and mass suicide. I had no idea that that most cults, especially now, are in what's called a large group awareness training. And many of you listening may be, and I can't even tell you how many times people in my circle of friends would be like, well, I would never fall for that. Or I came to an ESP intro session and I could totally tell it was culty. I love Landmark. That's what they would say. Or I'm, I'm, Landmark's not a cult or PSI is not a cult. 
or um, Course in Miracles, or I just do Transcendental Meditation. <laughs> I've since learned that all of these things are hugely problematic. And I personally am massively allergic to any large group awareness training because the, the ability or the um, ripeness for abuse of power is off the charts. And we can talk more about that later. So I was on a cult and I know that's loaded. You can call it a high demand group. It doesn't matter. I was out. The most important thing is the Eastern District of New York called it a criminal organization and put Keith behind bars for 120 years. So that's the, the good news and that's the backstory. Sorry, it took me a little longer than I thought. I went, I went on some tangents there. But my main thing to share with you now today is like healing. And many of you, I hope most of you have not been in a cult, but I think that everybody can relate to having some sort of trauma or some sort of significant life event that causes you to shut down and you have to figure out how to like reconnect with yourself to find that, that pain or that vulnerability to start expressing again. So I'm just going to go over a couple of things real quickly and then we'll get into the creative aspect. Woohoo. Yes. I see that. Yes. 120 years. Hashtag 120. Okay. So quick things for healing. One for me was self-care. I did a lot of um, things to make sure that myself, my body was okay. I had to put extra locks on my doors just for my safety, but I did things like Epsom salt baths, grounding foods, walks in nature, forest bathing is a real thing. Um, I also had to learn how to sleep again. We'd been trained that we only needed five hours or six hours a night, and I was massively sleep deprived. Um, then I had to do a lot of self-education. Luckily, this is the golden age of cult awareness. So there's um, so many podcasts and books and documentaries. We've got Going Clear, Holy Hell, The Vow, Wild Wild Country, all these things, by the way, are on a resource list that I have on my website, sarahedvinson.com slash resources. I'll type that in there later. And uh, that really helped me understand what the fuck had happened to me. But I also needed help from a therapist. And I found a trauma therapist and also a cult expert. I have a couples counselor. I have a whole team. Highly recommend therapy, but you have to work to find someone that doesn't trigger you, <laughs> which took me a long time. Um, the fourth is very apropos for today. It was finding healthy community. That was so hard for me because I was just so skeptical and untrusting uh, for so many years. And one of the things that was important for me in terms of expression is that in my old community, and I didn't realize at the time, is that I was so suppressed because we couldn't express anything negative. And the first time I got together with members of the community and, and was able to share freely what was really going on for me and to say something like, for those of you who've seen the vow, Nancy's Keith's right-hand woman, she was like, she was mean. You know, I also called her my bonus mother and totally revered her, but behind closed doors, she was, or even publicly, she shamed people. One time she got mad at me for recruiting too many people from Vancouver who were gluten-free to her trainings. And I was like, really? Like rice crackers are gonna break your budget? But she got mad at me for that. And so in this group of friends, former Nexium members, for me, for me be able, I can't even say it for me to be able to say, you know, Nancy's a bitch. Oh, like just the, the level of freedom and the weight off my shoulders to say how I really felt felt was unbelievable. Number five, reclaiming time, values, and goals. So for me, when I was in Nexium, I had so many, for example, conference calls. I had our blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks of the proctor call, senior proctor call, coaching call, executive call. When I cleared my schedule, I all of a sudden had a this free eye calendar and being like, what am I going to do with my time? What, who am I? What do I even like? I don't know. I had, to, I had to get back in touch with that again. And my family and I have spent a long time developing new traditions. I never had a free weekend when I was in Nexium ever. There was always a training or something to go to. And all of a sudden I can go to the farmer's market and do Saturday pancakes and spend time as a family in nature. And that's been imperative in my healing. And finally, learning how to deal with emotions properly. In Axiom, we always suppressed everything and overrode it with this toxic positivity. And like, if you were feeling low or down, you weren't allowed to be there. You'd have to do a state change and pick up. And like, everything is great and so great. So to actually go into that shame and the feelings of betrayal and anger and fear and actually feel them, what do you do with all that? Well, that's where the creativity comes in. And I'll be totally honest, at the beginning, I had zero interest. I was so in fight or flight, my PTSD and CPTSD was so uh, rampant. I could you know, barely get by, I could barely sleep. I wasn't eating, I was not in good shape. And luckily my mom dragged me to this creative writing workshop called 
the Wild Women Writing Circle. And this would have been in the fall of 2017, so a few months after I got out. And I loved it because there's all these, these older women in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. And then there's me who's like got my journal and just trying to figure out how to cope. And she gave us the space. To, she'd give us like a, a theme or a structure. And we did this creative writing. And I want to read to you something that I wrote at this time that um, I think kind of is very special to me because I wrote it in, in this workshop and it was surrounded by these supportive women. And I never edited a single word. And I feel like the poem captures where I was right at that time, not where I am now. And I can look back at it and go, wow, I've like totally moved past that point. But it's, this point was still very much um, where I was still in a lot of pain and trying to grapple with my loss of friendship of all the people that I left behind and also, you know, the scar that I was left with. So this poem is called The Scar. <clears throat> It's fading now, reminds me that he never owned me. Their silence erodes the memories of our friendship and leaves me naked. Where was I before I met you, floating and eager, too young to catch the flags? My heart, open and pure, I have love around my neck. Me too, their voices merged around me and held my hand so I could speak. Before I leave to heal, I plant barbed wire between us and wrap myself in cashmere sheets. I'm back, ready for the leaves to turn and to start again. So that was the, that was the beginning for me of my, my healing was that, um, was that workshop and stuff just flowed out of me. And if you told me then that I was gonna write a book, I never would have believed it because I was still so fragile, but the space in my creative writing allowed me to tap into stuff that I, I couldn't even articulate in words, not even in therapy yet. It was so good for me to write down, especially my dreams. I had so many dreams where I would be confronting people because um, I didn't get to have closure with so many of these people. I just left. And all of a sudden people were at my wedding were now my enemies and they were shunning me because I had destroyed the company. Um, I've had enough, I've since had a lot of reconciliation, but not with everyone. And I probably never will. But I, I did all these things um, at the beginning just to like get, you know, get my grounding. And then a year, a year later, uh, I decided to write a book. Because one of the silver linings of being public is that people would come to me and say, let's do this. So I, a lit agent came to me and, and said, I think you should write a book. I will help you. She helped me find a co-writer. Um, and this was a, I have a mixed feelings about this book. I, I did find it overall very cathartic to tell my story in my terms. The problem was is that I had a publisher who was also thinking about, you know, how to get the book out there. And she wanted it to come out at the time that Keith was sentenced. So it was in the news again. And that put a deadline on it that I was not ready for because I also had a newborn, my second child. And honestly, I barely even remember <laughs> the writing of this book, but I did it. There it is. And um, I'm gonna talk about a little bit more about the scar in a minute, but there's scarred. And I, I don't recommend um, writing a memoir on under a, a tight deadline. That being said, if I didn't have a deadline, it probably never would have been uh, written at all. So um, hard to say, but I think that the thing that really blew up my whole reconnection to myself and my creativity again was when the vow came out, which was another year later. And the vow was wild because maybe partly with the pandemic and so many people watching, but I, my inbox got flooded on social media and, and personally and, and uh, people just reaching out to say any variety of things like, I watched the vow and I left the toxic church I was in, or I watched the vow and I realized my, you know, my husband was gaslighting me and I ended the relationship, or I watched the vow and I realized what the red flags looked like. And I didn't join this group that I was invited to, or I watched the vow and I was able to process something that happened to me 20 years ago. I didn't know that's what it was. And that connection with complete strangers about what had happened to them fueled something in me that I, I'm still trying to articulate, but I feel like that is my main source of creativity is being able to help people because that is what I, that's what I wanted out of Nexium. That's what I thought I was doing. And obviously I bet on the wrong horse and we know that now, but now is actually able to 
to connect. And that's really why I wanted to become an artist in the first place. I have a very vivid memory of being in Montreal when I was getting my theater degree and seeing a Michel Tremblay play and having like a huge, I mean, I cry, I cry, I'm a big crier. And I had a huge like cathartic cry at the end of the play. And I thought like, that's why I'm an artist. That's why I'm a storyteller to give people these experiences. And now I was, I was the subject and I was not a producer of the vow, the subject who just like the story was out there. And now people were having experiences and waking up for themselves and, and sharing that with me. And I was just like, so fulfilled more than anything I'd ever done in my, in my entire life. Um, and that led to somebody reaching out to me who saw the vow and said, um, we're, then they were ex-evangelical, this uh, partner, uh, husband and wife team. And they said to citizens of sound, and they said, uh, we think you should do a podcast because we want to hear more and we want to produce it. I was like, a podcast? Like everything is in the vow. <laughs> what, what could you possibly want to know? So I put it out on social media and said, do you guys want a podcast? And everyone was like, yes, we want more. We have more questions. And I was like, okay. And this was COVID time. So, you know, my husband and I are like, pretty easy thing to do. We, we're having these conversations with people anyway. Why don't we record them and share them so that our wisdom from what we've learned from the shit show bec can become content for other people. And somebody actually wrote to us and pitched us a little bit culty, which was the name of the podcast. And she outlined what we could do and how she would help us if we chose her to be a producer which we did so everything kind of just organically came to us in such a way that like Nippy and I talk about Nippy's my husband um that one who's not named after a duck but Nippy's another story and I'll, I'll share that later but we talk about how like the whole cult experience was so dark you know we were we were really enmeshed with some really dark awful forces and as soon as we got out the light and the people that came to us to support us and um you know show us a another path out and that's been the path of my creative healing is all of these things the writing the, the memoir the vow the podcast and and then on a whole other level um advocacy has been a part of that for me because i got um aligned with an organization called hashtag i got out similar to hashtag me too. It's a group of people, survivors, experts, and whistleblowers who are unified by that hashtag. And it's really encouraging people to tell their story, to share their story, blow the shame off the whole stigma of cultic abuse and abuses of power in general. And has, that hashtag is also, uh, oh, there's the podcast. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, and by the way, quick thing, Take Back Your Life is the book that is kind of the, the template for a lot of this talk in terms of healing from cultic abuse. Um, quick sidebar, I love this book. When I got out, I had a hard time reading. So I harassed Yanya Lalich, who's, who's become a friend and also one of our guests on our podcast. And she let me narrate this book. So if you know someone who's recovering from cults or abusive um, anything, this is a great book. And it's also an audible narrated by me. Um, so it's a wonderful book. It's on my resource list. It's the thing I, I recommend to everybody and all of the key points for healing, except for the creative stuff um, are in here. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, let's see, where was I? I'm trying to wrap it up. So we have time for questions. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, so I think that kind of summarizes it. I think the, the thing with the podcast and the vow and the thing the, the one of the nuggets I want to share with you is that the irony is not lost on me. If you remember that I, when I met Mark, I wanted to make conscious shifting media. And every now and then Mark and I virtually high five, like, yep, did it. I feel like the vow pulled all those things together for me. And now I'm able to um, really own my story and tell my narrative in my own terms. And I continue to do that with the podcast. I wouldn't say that I am healed, but I'm healing. I am, I'm doing okay. I've got two beautiful boys, a very supportive husband that I met in Nexium. So that's the major silver lining. I also wanted you to know that I had this removed with plastic surgery. There's just a thin little white line, like a cesarean scar now. So it's completely well, almost 90%, 99% gone. And I really truly feel like I've reclaimed my voice. And I believe that the creative process comes from being free, 
to think for myself truly, which has obviously been a huge journey to not care what, I wouldn't say what anybody thinks, but not what everybody thinks to get over what they would call my like me disease because going public certainly challenged that and learning to trust my gut again. I think that if you can put shame and doubt, which I think we all have, whether you've been in the calls or not, put it in the back seat and let the creativity of truth and freedom and expression that is everyone's birthright, take the wheel. There's no limit to where you can go. You can take back your creativity and you can take back your life. So thank you for your time and let's answer some questions. How's that? Perfect, thank you, that was great. <laughs> Um, okay, we're just going to dive right in. Is that cool? So yes, a bit, dive a in. Bit, I, I saw um, a lot of questions coming through, but I didn't. Uh, they were, and they were, so I, ha I have a whole bunch, and I have some that came okay. through the back door. So um, right off the bat, <clears throat> I'll just ask. I'm going to go ahead and just read these so we can move quickly. Annie asks, "Where is Sarah sitting? Where are you, Sarah?" Oh, I'm in a little jail cell that Mark created <laughs> for me. <laughs> <laughs> to show how truly free I am. No, I am sitting, Mark created this for me because I am at home with two kids and I would not have the style, I'd have like, mommy, I need my bottle if I stayed at home. So I'm, I'm at Mark's, where are we? In your, in your co-work space? Yeah, it's like our amenity room in my building. Amenity room. room, yeah. So you see that wall right there? She's on the other side of that wall right there. Yeah, we're right, we're right, there we are. <laughs> okay, Cindy and Annie, a uh, different Annie, both set, asked a similar question. So I'm gonna summarize, uh, paraphrase it for you. Um, they both would like to know, and I think everybody here would like to know, given all the negative press and Keith's reputation and uh, his sort of notoriety for going after people with litigation and what have you, and and all the fear from the from the powers that be and and, and the re potential reper repercussions, how did you prepare and what was the process and what, how did you go public with this? Like what, what was that process like a little bit? I'm sure you've talked about this mm. before, but people- Yeah, no problem. It must've been terrifying. It was terrifying. <laughs> In fact, the, the, the first two thirds of this book, I feel like are kind of boring to be honest, but the last third where I wake up and figure out what the fuck to do, read like a crime novel. Like it, it it, it's when you think about like being in your forties and like working with the FBI, it's horrific because we didn't know um, what was gonna happen. We thought for sure we would be sued. Uh, and I think being in Canada protected us somewhat. Keith, uh, Claire Bronfman did come to Vancouver and spent three days with the Vancouver police department trying to set up a case to get me arrested. Of course, we know that failed, but um, we knew that it was happening and we knew that it was, um, imminent and that she did try to, you know, come up with a smear campaign. Um, we've since talked to people who stayed after us and Claire would said to them like, okay, give me the dirt on Sarah and Nippy, like, what can we use? And um, they tried, it, it, you know, honestly, it, and I think the book documents this well more so than the vow because the vow does can't like cover everyone's waking up process. It really went from, holy fuck, like I have to get out and then, oh my God, I have to like bring my friends. Um, and uh-oh, uh-oh, Mark, low power. How is that possible? Oh, Andrea, can you One go second. help her? I, I had it plugged in, but maybe unplug that. It, hold on, maybe it's not plugged in pro properly. One Andrea's second. coming. No, I plugged it. I oh, got it. Oh, okay. no, unless plugged in. It says it's not plugged in properly. Oh, maybe no it's this. We'll save you. Keep, keep talking. We'll save you. Wait, wait, wait. Why is it working? I don't know. Go fix it. Oh, no, I'm plugged in. Andrea, I'm okay. good. Don't worry. Okay. Okay. Andrea, the star behind the scenes. Hi, Andrea. <laughs> no, I'm good. It just wasn't, plug it wasn't like plugged in properly. Oof, glad I caught that. Um, so I didn't really prepare. It was more just like, like as I got, as I was waking up and getting out, I was finding out more and more what was actually going on. And even still, it was even like a 10th of what we found out in the trial, which was, was a year later. So every, what everyone knows now about what Keith was doing, we didn't have that full picture yet. So um, yeah, as Sandra is saying, there's still people who support him and are out there thinking that I'm the bad person and that I, I'm the one that should be in jail, truly. Um, but they're deep, deeply, deeply indoctrinated. And I unfortunately I understand where they're coming from because I used to be there. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I didn't prepare. Yeah. 
um, let's just let's keep moving forward. So we, we got 10 more minutes. Sure. Um, oh, my gosh. Okay. David Newman, David Newman uh, says, looking south of the border, Trump Republicanism is often referred to now as a cult. How accurate do you think that categorization is? Does that fit your definition? Well, I try not to get political in our podcast, but I we, what we do is we look at processes of what like defines a cult and what defines a narcissist and what defines a sociopath. And if you look at those checklists, you know, <laughs> so yeah. But I also have to say that there's extremism on both sides. And um, one of the things we talk about is like, if you feel like you are righteous towards the other side and there's an us versus them, it's problematic. There's like, there's culty behaviors and abuses of power on both sides is just what I'm saying. But I think um, we'll probably all have similar opinions about Trump. Maybe. Christine asks, um, what is your relationship to self-help now? Do you still use any of the tools you learned or have you turned away from most of it now? Generally, I'm allergic to self-help. Um, I don't like the word coach. I don't like the word goals. I don't like the word success. It's all very gross to me, but I, that's still part of my healing. Um, one of the things I've done though, is look at the tools that I got and figure out where I got them from so that I can, I'm sorry, where Keith got them from, because he mostly stole his whole curriculum. And so if I can figure out where they, I got them from, I don't have to say, thank you, Vanguard, after using it. Um, and that's a, a real relief for me. So it's that, and that's taken time. Okay, this one's a little long, and it's really good. This was actually the first person who quietly texted me and said, I want to ask this anonymously, because I was in okay. <laughs> uh, It's interesting how many people uh, don't want to identify as Nexium, um, right? Like it's, no, it's why would you want to be related to a sex shame. cult? I, know, I mean, I know, I know. You know, so anyway, and could I, but wait, hold on, before you ask yeah. say that, Mark, I want to say something. I think it's awesome that you said that you were involved at, because most people don't understand that if you just took the curriculum on the outside, you didn't, you weren't harmed and you weren't part of the sex cult. The sex cult stuff happened in well, Albany behind closed doors. You well, don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, how did the sex cult happen? And I only had sex with my husband. Like, what, what, what did I miss everything? Anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So this person anonymously says at the beginning, so beginning in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, they realized that, that they were in a cult situation and watching your documentary and following uh, the follow-up documentary seduced made them aware and they went to the police uh, one of the leaders is now unfortunately dead and the woman supporting him was just like your story is still out and currently doing teaching under a different persona that she created the police couldn't do anything about months of investigation there wasn't enough evidence or laws in the this person is in the uk in the uk regarding this as the events happened in two different countries and so now this person and their best friend from the cult are just left with this experience, no justice, can't talk about it anywhere, and constantly thinking to themselves and asking, what the fuck do I do with this experience? Do you have any ideas uh, or suggestions for this person? Yeah, I mean, our path was like, before we went to the New York Times, we did go to authorities. So I think if you if there's somebody that, that you can go to, there is an FBI hotline, I don't know where this happened, but in the US we have an FBI hotline. Um, I have a couple of contacts there that I could connect somebody with um, still if anybody wants that. But I think ultimately the, the authorities didn't know what to do with it. It was then going to the New York Times and doing an expose that caused the authorities to act. So, um, you know, unfortunately, like I have a mixed feeling about the media. I, I really appreciate what they did for us. And at the same time, like sex cult is like really unfortunate for so many people. So it's, a, you have to find the right outlet, but going public with your story is not for everybody. It takes incredible strength and in, because you go under public scrutiny, but it's what, what we had to do anyway, to get it shut down. Did answer? It is. I just asked this okay. person, um, if they wanted to share their email address with me, can I can I connect you to them? Yes, directly? of course. Okay. Yeah. Um, Eleanor uh, W says, "How has your creativity blossomed since you managed to get the cult out of your life?" Hi, Eleanor. I yes, love Eleanor. It's that Eleanor. Yeah, it's that Eleanor. <laughs> <laughs> Who's also decluttered my home, by the way. Oh, great. Um, yeah, she's incredible. 
I was, I mean, what people don't really get about being in a cult is that like, you can't express yourself, right? You, you really can't unless it's, unless it's like in tribute, like you can sing a song if it's in tribute to the leader, you know what I mean? But there's no room for anything new. Um, so it's taken me time to like really figure out how to express free, freely because the gaslighting also, gaslighting works because you tend to gaslight yourself. You know, you start to have the same inner voice going like, is that true? And like, are you just doing like, one of the things that people said about me when I laughed to discredit me is that I was doing all of this for attention, you know, right. and that discredits me as a, like saying, oh, just doing it for the book deal. Like, yeah, really waiting for that to pay off guys, <laughs> you know, or doing it for the money. And that voice of, of like punishment and self-criticism is very strong. And both Nippy and I have had to take a long time to like dismantle that. Um, so it's, it's, it's an ongoing journey. Oh, I forgot to mention in my healing process that um, I do microdose psilocybin and that's really helped me to like kind of reset the neural pathways. And I also eat gummies for my creativity. A little bit of THC, a little bit of legal gummies, just a little bit. And that's helped me with my creativity. Okay. Is okay to Look, say? Totally, totally. I'm okay. stoned out of my tree right now. No, I'm not kidding. Oh, great. <laughs> Um, uh, oh, can I answer a question that's it, that I uh, want to answer? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just see a lot of people mentioning things like um, asked and somebody saying like they had a good experience with Landmark. And I just want to say like, I'm never here to say like, that's a cult and that's a cult and that's a cult. A lot of these things, especially Landmark and ESP, like I said for you, Mark, there's always good shit on the outside of these groups. If you look at it like an onion, the rotten core is in the middle. And on the outside of the group is good stuff that lures people in. If you did landmark and you had a good experience, fucking great. Take the tools and put them in your life, but don't make it your life. Don't put all your time into becoming a coach. And that's when it becomes problematic and culty. And all of those things that people mentioned, I've done deep dives on. People got hurt. Abuses of power happened. People gave too much money, but you don't always see that stuff. Just because you had a good experience doesn't make it a cult. So that mean, doesn't mean it's not a cult. <laughs> Does that answer that one? That's great. Um, okay. Just scanning over the questions. So we have, um, uh, let's see, attraction of younger folks. We have more cult questions. Um, do, curious what happened. Yeah, well, okay, let's ask this one. So Suzanne Rushton wants to know about the other people that stayed in Nexium and now that it's all been blown apart. Mm -hmm. Do have more people realized the truth after Ranieri was found guilty? And, and what's the status of yes. that? Yes. So you and yeah, I many people a, you and I have a friend who still we've lost that friend. He he won't come back to us, right? Yeah. No, he won't come back. He, I mean, there's people who read the transcripts or attended the trial and they're like, holy shit, the evidence is there. And then there's other people who are still so bought in, they're doubling down, tripling down, and they're saying, Well, all that evidence was just planted by the FBI. You know, like there's always a, there's always a way to keep changing the, you know, changing the bar of like, well clearly the justice system is corrupt <laughs> you know like he didn't get due process no he got due process he had six weeks trial with a jury of his peers and the evidence was overwhelming that's why he got 120 years they can't see it they can't see it because there's the, the he's so good and so noble that the world is not ready and they had to shut him down is what they think we have questions about the the cultiverse uh the role of influencers and in social media um, uh, questions about ethical storytelling, lessons uh, for other survivors of crime worth sharing. Uh, there's a, there, I've got at least six other questions, but we're at time now. So I'll tell you what, can we make a deal, Sarah? If yes. I post these questions to uh, perhaps to Twitter and to Facebook, would you, would you answer them? Would you respond yeah. to them? Yeah, okay. of course. Great. Yeah. I will do that and we will make sure everybody's questions get passed along. Um, okay. And with that, we're, we're, we're going to conclude now. So everybody, uh, please, a round of quiet applause for, for Sarah Edmonton, Edmonton for, for uh, being so brave and so generous with her time and sharing her story and, and insights. Thank you also for really focusing on the creativity and the healing part of your story. I really appreciate that. Thank you all. Thanks so much for having me. This is such a joy. And actually just preparing for the talk was a creative, creative endeavor and helped me to put some pieces together. So thank you for the opportunity to continue to grow and to share that 
and like you said at the beginning, hopefully be a little bit of a beacon. Amazing. 